What is up, you guys? Welcome to Word First Radio, the podcast brought to you by Word First Ministries. I am your host, Jacob O'Neill, and as always, I'm joined by my friends Cameron and hey. Bailey. Yep. Bailey, pray us in. Yep. Um, Lord, we thank you today for um, just the opportunities for evangelism and the opportunities to um, just do work that you've given us in the past month. Um, I pray that today we would be able to um, reflect on those and um, not just share them with our brothers and sisters listening in, but um, that we would be able to um, gain wisdom from those and that we'd be able to um, not just uh, let those experiences um, be one and done, but let those experiences inform our evangelism and our ministry moving forward. So Lord, we love you. We pray that you would be with us in this conversation guide our words um, so that we might become um, more wise than the foolish men that we are right now. Lord, we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bailey. Mm-hmm. Um, so, back in October, the last week of October, we had Skeptics Week in Oslo. Yes, we did. Oh, yeah. That was the first time we participated uh, at that event here in Oslo. We've yeah. done it uh, twice in Bergen, which was awesome, mm-hmm. and uh, we're looking forward to doing it again in I hope so. February. I think, have, I think we have a soft invitation to come back in February. I really hope so. We have oh. a, yeah, that's right. I hope Lago watches the podcast. That'd be really fun. Um, but yeah, we did it for the first time here in Oslo. Uh, Cam, can you just real quickly for the people, because we haven't talked about it in years, yeah. probably. What is Skeptics Week? Just what is that thing? Yeah, so there's, uh, oh gosh, how where how low do I go? So there's, um, <laughs> there's a Christian student organization called Laga, mm-hmm. and we have been... What? Best, I'm not saying it again. Okay. Um, <laughs> to work with them a few times. And that's actually, you know, we talk about, we came out for a couple of short-term trips before we moved to Norway. It was them that we got to work with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we have gone and helped with an event called Skeptics Week. And Skeptics Week is um, something that they do all over the world. You might, they, they call it, I think, Mission Week in other, in other parts of the world. Um, yeah. But in Norway, they call it Skeptics Week. And the point of it is um, it's kind of an apologetic evangelism week. So, mm-hmm. so the students who are part of the organization... Now, like in Bergen, all of the colleges that are there, all the departments of University of Bergen, what we do is we go and we evangelize and we open ourselves up to skeptics so they can ask us questions. There are um, lectures or debates in the evening time, but the whole idea is let's talk to this segment of the population, people who are who are skeptical, and let's talk to them about the, about the important things and, and hopefully share a gospel witness with them. Yeah, I think that's... I think that's sort of a broad, mm-hmm. broad brush strokes description of of, uh, of what that is. And this was the first time, like you said, that mm-hmm. we got to participate in Oslo, which mm-hmm. was uh, which was fantastic. Yeah. So what did we get to do? What happened? So they invited us out to be on the University of Oslo campus. We're making waffles yeah. and coffee. Yeah. Uh, I want you to talk about your coffee making skills in moments mm-hmm. and your wonderful, <laughs> I amazing idea. Know how to make coffee. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you got that, right? <laughs> this is genius. Yeah, so um, uh, we had uh, kind of in the evening times uh, like these four different lectures. On, well, three different lectures and one like kind of Q&A section, um, which was awesome. I don't know what the turnout is normally, like their median turnout you know, all around Norway, but it felt like a ton of people came yeah. to all of the lectures. There were, there were more every night. And the last night, there wasn't an empty seat. Yeah. It was full. Yeah. Yeah. People were spilling, yeah, spilling on the sides. And yeah, it's, mm. it's crazy. So that was really awesome. And most of them, I, uh, you know, there were people I recognized from talking to at the stands and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And yeah. it, was, it was just really cool to see a lot of interest be generated around. Um, just so you guys know, the lecture topics are, you know, are things like, did Jesus rise from the dead? And if so, like, what does that matter? Mm-hmm. Like, what what's the uh, what are the implications of that? And there was another lecture about um, uh, does science and God the conflict con- between conflict. science and faith the yeah. Conf- yeah the conflict between science and faith that was uh, and that's something we've talked about here uh, and so I mean that was really awesome we got it 
get that guy's number for yeah. sure and have him on. Um, it's one of the professors. So it's Professor Holm from, he's a physics professor at University of Oslo. Right. Who oh. gave a talk and he just wrote a book. In fact, I'm starting it today. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, nice. It's in Norwegian and it is, it's, it, it, yeah, it's going to be fun for me to try. It. Right. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah. So one of the professors there gave a talk. It was really good. And we were... Uh, we we're so glad to be able to record the audio and video of all the evening events, but we don't know what Laga is going to do with it. So mm. you know, we recorded it, and I've got to do a little bit of editing and just sort of putting files in the right place, and I'll hand it over to them. I don't know what they're going to do, but I wish that we could. <laughs> I wish that we could. <laughs> Anyways, but I'll, I'll reach out to Professor Holm and see if he would be interested in talking to us, because he's a really interesting guy with a... With a um, you know, I've been... I don't know. Say, I've, I've been uh, thinking about the interface of science and faith for a long time, right. and he was a really um, had a really great perspective that I, that I really appreciate. Mm-hmm. Well, it seems like the general like um, like that's one of the that was probably the most topic that people like like when I showed that showed it to them on the flyer, they were like, oh, like yeah. they're having to talk about that. But that honestly, like when I asked people, I was like, so before you come to the lecture tonight, mm-hmm. uh, what do you think? Do you think there's an apparent conflict between science and faith? Do you mm-hmm. think you have to scoop your brain out um, if you want to believe in God or be a Christian? Uh, it feels like most of the people, most of the students I talk to at least, uh, don't think so. They think like, no, I, I listen to podcasts where Christians and scientists talk all the time. Yeah. And I don't generally think so. Some of them are a little like more skeptical when it comes to like things like Genesis, like the first couple chapters, like, Hey, do I have to like take that literally? Yeah. Or if I take it literally, what are the implications of that? But it seems kind of generally the kind of attitude is moving more towards like, no, you can be a scientist and a Christian at the same time. Yeah, I think maybe the tacit view, they might not say that, but it's like the non-overlapping magisteria. Mm-hmm. So it's well, we have science, and that talks about one aspect of reality, and you have faith, which talks about another aspect of reality. Mm-hmm. Um, and the two of them, they just don't like you can be. It's like you can be both. Yeah, but it's not. The, the, I definitely didn't get the sense that people, by and large, thought that you could be an integrated whole person who is scientific and faithful, like at the same time about mm-hmm. the same things. Mm-hmm. And for those to be, uh, well, like I said, integrated. The, mm-hmm. But it's like, no, no, as long as they don't overlap. You have your science that talks to you about like how stuff works and your faith about, you know, helps you to cope or have hope or be a good person mm-hmm. or whatever. And I also didn't get the sense, um, you uh, disagree with me if I'm wrong about this, but I also mm-hmm. didn't get the sense that people thought, so I, I'm sorry, let me say this differently. I did get the sense that people thought about religious belief as though, that's sort of the make-believe that we have in order mm-hmm. to live good lives, hmm. in order to be nice people or, or something like that. So, it wasn't like, no, 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 you can be a committed Christian who believes in the re- literal resurrection of Jesus, and you can be a scientist who studies f- fossils, and right. <laughs> right? Or, or something like yeah. that. You can look at a micro... It, it didn't seem to be like that. It was like, no, 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 you can have a foot in the real world where you're talking about science, and that deals with real things. Mm-hmm. But then for those things that science can't really touch, then faith or religion, mm-hmm. religion is the thing that helps you to do those, and everyone can have a different one of those, and it yeah. doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. There wasn't the sense that, like, everyone can have a different science, and we all just get along, and science is the thing you use as a crutch when you need, like, yeah. no one's saying that, <laughs> right. but that, did, that definitely seemed to be, yeah. no. nobody, nobody said exactly those words to me, but that definitely seemed to be... Uh, I think that's a pretty good representation, or at least of the, the representation of the conversations that I had with people. Yeah, no, if that's the, if that's the sense you got, that's totally fair. Uh, I'm also just speaking to like um, the one-on-one or sometimes two-on-one mm-hmm. conversations I had when I was actually talking to people yeah. and like posing the questions to them. Mm-hmm. That that was the reaction I got. But if that's but if you're uh, uh, slightly opposite or slightly different, no, I don't think we're disagreeing at all. No, I don't no, think we're I don't disagreeing think so. at all. I just yeah. think that. I, I wanted to maybe add some some nuance or texture to what you said, which was totally fair. Which yeah. was, yeah, I, I agree that people believe, go, no, 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 you can be religious and scientific at the same yeah. time, but I don't think they saw that as an integrated worldview. I think they saw like, no, 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 you can be scientific and believe real things, but you can also have these superstitions that help you to like, right, to not kill people and not mm. hurt people. But like, you can have, yeah, you can have yeah. this fantasy part of your life. It's almost like asking, <laughs> uh, can I, can I be like a Harry Potter larper on the weekends and a scientist? And I'm like. Yeah, I was going to use. Can do both. Mm. I was going to use Lord of the Rings, yeah, but yeah. we went to the same analogy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, of course you can do both. And if yeah. you want to be a Harry Potter larper, like 
good on you. That's that's great. Mm-hmm. Do you want to, yeah, I think right. I think that that was my experience. Yeah, but very cool. And we'll get into actual like yeah. conversations uh, later inside. But what was your takeaways from Skeptics Week? How was your experience doing it, um, especially with being a new dad? Uh, yep. Bold, first of all, no. Uh, but coming out and doing Skeptics Week, uh, what was what are some? I'd of your rather t- talk to strangers about God than be no. in this house for one more minute. <laughs> <laughs> that was not true at all. A, it was a tough choice, I'm sure. But anyways, um, how, what what were some of your takeaways about takeaways? Yeah. Um, so I, just to like uh, frame Skeptics Week a tiny bit more, um, I would say like it was really. Um, cool here we so we didn't go out to if you've um heard us talk about our previous skeptics Mm -hmm. weeks trips Mm -hmm. um we went to lunch tables and asked people to take a survey so like we're interrupting people in Mm -hmm. the middle of their day um for this skeptics week we just had a booth with waffles and coffee and they came to us Mm -hmm. and Boy, did they come? Yeah, like yeah, they, they did. Were, yeah, there were giant lines. Goodness every day. gracious! If you want to catch a Norwegian, like waffle bait, <laughs> offer them a waffle. <laughs> That's um, right. So um, the really like cool part of this week is just seeing that at minimum we're like, especially being on a college campus, like we're right in the middle of the biggest university in all of Norway. Is that true? sure? Yeah, yeah UIO. I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's definitely in all of Oslo, but um, probably Norway. Yeah, um, at least where we were. It was the biggest yeah. university where we were standing. <laughs> On that, that campus, it's yeah. the biggest university. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so we're standing in the middle of this university and um, just able to, at minimum, um, get conversations going. Because mm-hmm. um, we're not just giving people a waffle or coffee. Like we're, we have a big team of people who are all around uh, the line, like pestering different people, not pestering. Evangelizing. Kindly, kindly <laughs> walking up to people and um, starting with something like, hey, have you heard of Skeptics Week? Do you know what we're all about? Um, so at minimum, we're able to um, just bring up those big questions mm-hmm. in people's minds and um, invite them to consider those questions. But at best, we're able to um, start evangelistic um, actual relationships with people. Um, so Skeptics Week is just awesome. Um, it's terrifying, mm-hmm. but it's awesome. Um one like takeaway I think I'd share is um, that for me personally, I realized in the um, terrifyingness of it mm-hmm. all, um, I realized that I had gone out to a few conversations um, trying to use the muscles that I know you guys have. And it's because like I see you guys flex these muscles when we're at the coffee cart or when we're out for Skeptics Week. Mm-hmm. And you guys are um, very apologetics minded and like able um, to take Christianese out of it. Like you're able to argue really well and to pose a question or have a question posed to you. And you guys are able to have a conversation with that um, or from that. Um, But I realized that in a few conversations I was going out trying to use the apologetics muscles that I have, which are like really tiny (laughs) compared to your guys's cams are like three degrees worth. So Mm -hmm. sorry, ouch. (laughs) Sorry, Cam in the future. (laughs) Uh, Uh, Hey guys, welcome to (laughs) work. But, (laughs) um, yeah. So I, I realized that for me, just, I was, um, going out trying to use muscles that I don't have, um, and then I, once I realized that I switched it up and started using more of my muscles where mm-hmm. I'm more relational and, um, just like focusing on the person ba- basically is what my in was. Mm-hmm. So slowing down to, instead of launching straight into apologetic style questions for me, slowing down to, Hey, what's your name? Um, mm-hmm. what classes are you taking? And just like, asking questions to get to know the person, yeah. let them know, like, let them see my baby that just came out two weeks ago. <laughs> I love mm-hmm. that one. Um, no one says, no, do you want to see a picture of my baby? Yeah. <laughs> they have to say yes. It's really yeah. good. It's, it's good. Really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for the Lord. So for me, I realized just that that was a way stronger technique for me. And I didn't have um, maybe one or two conversations that were actually apologetic or evangelistic mm-hmm. um, that leaned into that realm. Um, but I was able to get into many conversations where we were at least talking about mm-hmm. like 
there are questions that need to be considered. Have yeah. you considered them? Come tonight. Like, oh, you got to run to class? Well, even if you do, come grab free pizza tonight and, like, let's talk about those questions more afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, Skeptics Week is awesome. And I wanted to say all of that just to say, like, um, I think of our team with the coffee cart. Mm-hmm. So we have this opportunity each week to um, basically do the same thing. Go and um, bring up the big questions of life. And ultimately, our goal is to evangelize to people. Mm-hmm. Um, but at minimum, our goal is to love and serve and um, just be amongst our community. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have that opportunity each week. But um, you two are the only, like, really uh, either natural or practiced um, evangelists, hmm. I think, on our team. If we're, like, speak, speaking really plainly. Um, and for the rest of the team, we that's not our natural realm at all. Yeah. And it is not our practice realm at all. Um, so it's scary. But there's something... Um, as we were going about Skeptics Week, we kept coming to the conversation of like, man, this is what our church plant is going to be like. Mm-hmm. Um, and Cam, you mentioned like um, that our Sundays might look something like we gather for breakfast, just like we did for Skeptics Week. Mm-hmm. We have breakfast, we read scripture together, and then we go out and evangelize, mm-hmm. just like we're doing every day here for Skeptics Week. Um, and for me, um, that kind of like something way back when we had Todd Moore on Mm -hmm. the podcast, like um, how he just made it in my mind so obvious that every Christian ought to be involved in regular evangelism Mm -hmm. um, and how that's a realistic thing. Like it seems like a scary, unapproachable and way too high of a um, bar for us to possibly reach. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think, it really can happen, especially when we, um, like, take a, take inventory of ourselves and realize, kind of like I was able to do, like, I don't have the muscles that Cam and Jake have, mm. but um, I for sure have the muscles to share the gospel. Yeah. Um, even as much as I might doubt that because of the scariness, like, I for sure know Jesus. I know the um, good news and... The sacrifice, like, I know it personally, Mm -hmm. and every Christian who is a true Christian knows it that way. Like, we know that we know this message message personally, Um, but the way that we share it, just we need to be willing to overcome the fear, even if it means we're using muscles that aren't getting us to evangelistic conversations right Mm -hmm. away. Like, um, if our starting point is um, leaning on our pop culture, like, Mm -hmm. I I watch The Office and all these different shows so, like, I can relate to people. Or I'm in a board game, so I'll go to a board game club Mm -hmm. and we'll play there. Like, whatever our strengths are, like, to use those strengths for our um, efforts of evangelism. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Yeah, that's all I'd say. Right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's how the the work is going to get done, to be honest. And so, there's there's a Mm bar-ish Mm-hmm. But there's a command that we've talked about a lot that all Christians have to reach to. The bare minimum is evangelize, right? Mm-hmm. The bare minimum is not, oh, however, some people like to make it, but it's not. The bare minimum is not be an apologetics genius mm-hmm. or be a philosophy major or, you know, make sure you memorize all the arguments and stuff and are able to argue with people. Um, that's not the bar. Uh, but the bar is evangelize, right? Mm-hmm. And so there are different ways. Um, That we might approach it naturally just because of how God built us, what God gifted us with, what we're more comfortable with, and all of that. There might be, there will be different ways that I'll approach Mm -hmm. a conversation. Like I could talk, I could have eight different evangelism conversations and approach it very, each one very differently. One might be more relational. Mm -hmm. One might be this person wants to argue. And so, like, okay, well, it's fun to me. So Mm -hmm. let's go for it. Um, but I, I might approach several different conversations very differently. And I'm going to be better at some things than the other things just because of how God made me. But I know that the bar, the minimum goal is evangelize. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you're right. That's what we're all called to. Everyone who's a Christian uh, knows the gospel by definition because we're Christians who have been saved to this gospel and we have to go evangelize. And so, um, 
Yeah, I think that's awesome, especially yeah. with a newborn. I mean, I'm just I love evangelizing together and doing all of that. Yeah, Following one day, I brought him and had him. In <laughs> that's right. Sure. That's a great. That's a really great strategy, to be honest. Uh, and just as effective as waffles. That's right. <laughs> almost waffles are pretty effective, to be honest. Um, but very cool. So, how about we go ahead and just jump right into it? What were some of the highlights in terms of conversations? Who are some of the people we talked to? How did that go? What kind of questions did they ask that we can maybe offer up as fruit for things for us to talk about? Rifan, um, I, I'll let you guys go first. Well, I think it went. I think it went really well. Mm-hmm. Let me think about how to explain that, though. So, our conversations were, for the most part. I mean, there are a couple of. There are always weird people or rude people or something. Sure. Very few of those compared to mm-hmm. my experience in the United States. Um, people overwhelmingly were respectful, even slightly interested, willing to talk to us. I mean, yeah. willing to talk to us. <clears throat> Nobody felt like we were doing a bait and switch or like, wait, what? Yeah. You're doing what? That's like, the they knew fun they were thing. standing in line for a waffle and they know, knew they were going to get talked to about yeah. something. Mm. And when we told them what was going on. They willingly took flyers and pictures of the things and showed mm-hmm. up to the event in the evening. We had free pizza, which I think uh, was probably wise also. Mm-hmm. Um, but the conversations were... I don't know. They, I, I don't know how to explain it because Norwegians in general tend, it's a very cold culture. Like yeah. you're not just talking to the people around you. Mm. Um, it's not something you do. But they seem to be so much more respectful and kind and genuine mm-hmm. in the conversations we, we were having with one another. So it was really um, like a, it was really a positive experience. Mm-hmm. But the worldview. That's like if I can sort of distill all of the conversations we had, or if, mm-hmm. if I can like average them into a worldview. Yeah. Man, is it lacking. Mm-hmm. Like it's, and frustratingly so. Mm-hmm. Or you hear people say stuff, and you're like, you seem really bright, but you just in rapid succession said all of these really dumb things that also can't mm. all be true. And um, it's a little, it's a little bit frustrating. What, it was a little bit frustrating. I'll just, I think sure. I'll just leave it there. Yeah. But most of the conversations are really, were really nice and kind. And, you know, some of them are even continuing now. And the people were friendly and, you know, it didn't seem like they're being hoodwinked. They're glad to have waffles, happy right. to talk to us about, about stuff. And, and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just say that for well, now. Yeah. It was, well, I had a couple, uh, conversations that were kind of like that kind of contradictory like yeah it's like hey you uh i think we should think about this some more kind of yeah. like it didn't really fresh like talking like if i want to be like a philosopher about it like it'll frustrate me probably to think about it but i'm in the moment i wasn't it wasn't that frustrating for me but it was more just kind of like how is like can we shine a light on that real quick like let's put this in a spotlight so you can see how this is really contradictory i shared a story about frank on my social media mm-hmm. um and that was a wonderful conversation he wasn't rude at all he was he was very kind frank uh walks up to our booth and remember the question he asked us do you remember this guy yeah yeah if jesus was in front of you right now what would you ask him yeah it's a pretty great question um I, I mean, I had never thought about it. Your answer, I thought, was really great. Cameron's answer was, uh, unless you want to say it again. I no, I got it. Cameron's answer was... Greatness just flows out of me. I can't even remember <laughs> all of it that I spill all over the place. So Cameron's answer was, well, Frank, for God so loved the world that he gave <laughs> is only... Be- no, uh, uh, Cameron's answer was, well, I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus, so I'm not really in a rush to get all my questions I'm answered right now. I boiled it down to just one. <laughs> hey, if Jesus is here for five minutes, what am I going to ask him? Yeah. I'm, I'm expecting we get to spend forever. Ever together. That is really great. You were right about that. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have we're gonna have forever I like with each it. other. So Man, I'm good. <laughs> it was a good answer. Yeah. And so he was really kind. Uh, but so as he was drinking his coffee, he wanted to talk more about, you know, Jesus and, and truth. And so I uh, I don't know exactly how we got there, but somewhere in the conversation after talking about what he does for a living or what he thinks about some of the topics, he just ended up uh, telling me all about like uh, well, I think per- people's like lived experience and their personal identities are really important. Mm-hmm. And so he he went to great lengths to tell me about how well people say about themselves is important, how people express themselves is really, mm-hmm. really important. We should listen to people and their experiences and care about them. And so I'm listening to his experiences and what he's saying about himself and what he's saying is really important. And so I, I thought like, you know, I, I, th- I think you're right. I think what people say about themselves is important. 
you know, we were talking about Jesus earlier. You came and asked us, you know, if Jesus said, somehow I transitioned very expertly <laughs> the conversation over to Jesus. And I said, what would you say? Because uh, Jesus says he's God in the New Testament. And not like once, like multiple times. And the people uh, try and kill him for it, like multiple times. What, w- what would you say about Jesus? Like, because that's what he, how he expressed himself. Well, that's what he said about himself. He finished his coffee and was like, I had asked him what drugs he took, threw it away. And he's like, thanks for the coffee and left. Mm-hmm. And I'm just kind of like, I really wish he had stayed so we could look at that. Yeah. How do you not see like the utter contradiction like of your words, like right there? Like on one hand, you said, what people have to say about themselves is important. And then I'm like, well, what about this guy said this about himself? Oh, man, what drugs has he been taking? Yeah. A very interesting contradiction, very tragic contradiction, I would say. I mean, that's your answer? That I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was yeah. just like, oh, I mean, well, I, c- I mean, I couldn't believe it in the sense that, like, it was obviously, like, really ironic and, like, self-refuting. Mm-hmm. I was like, it's almost like he's the one who didn't listen to himself for five minutes. Um, but also, like, more heartbreaking at the same time where it's just kind of like, all right, man, like, like that's that's going to be your answer that you'll have to give an account for one day. Yeah, that's so, pretty heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. It's it's awful. And Because um, he's not. He's going to see Jesus. Yeah. And he's going to be made aware that Jesus is God Almighty. And he's not going to say to him, what drugs have you been on? Right. That's what... Like, that conversation is coming. Yeah. I hope it doesn't... Mm-hmm. I hope it's not like that. I hope that he... I hope it's not like that either. I yeah. hope Frank watches this and says... And finds out that this is what I really think about his answer. No. And um, But knowing he's going to yeah. face Jesus someday, and he's not going to say, why do you think you're God? What drugs have you been on? Like, that's not yeah. the conversation that's coming when Jesus returns as judge. Yeah. <sighs> no one will say that. Uh, well, no one will say the snarky things that you know, atheists in interviews are asked like, well, what will you say if you die and you stand before God? Dawkins one time said that, um, well, I'd ask, which one are you? I'd ask if you're, you know, Allah or Krishna or something like that. No, he's not. If Richard Dawkins dies without Jesus, that's not what he's going to say. Dawkins is going to know who he is. And um, God would have a lot more to answer for to me than I would to him. Right. Yeah. And it's brutal. It's yeah. so this is the stuff of like like just serious life. Like this is what when we're talking to people about things like the gospel, uh, or when Christ asks us to ask the world, who do you say that he is? Mm-hmm. Who do you say that Jesus is? Um it's a heavy question, and I think um I think we should uh answer the same thing Peter did. Yeah. But um yeah, had, so that that's just one experience that I had of that kind of contradictory, just like I had something values and so worldview. I talked yeah. to a young man who, at the end of our conversation, he goes, "Oh, maybe I've just read too much Nietzsche," and I'm like, "Yeah, maybe it's just not quite enough. <laughs> <laughs> You've read enough to, anyways." So the our conversation was really interesting because he asked some questions that I was kind of like, "Well, I need to be prepared and I need to think about deeply and think well," but. He said things like, well, what if, if the Bible's true, what difference does that make? Mm. And I'm going, are you serious? If the Bible's, he's like, yeah, what, like, if it's true, why should I care? What difference does it make to my life at all? And that was a really curious question to me. But in the course of our conversation, I was like, I said that, I was like, what do you mean? What, what difference does it make? Like, it changes the course of your life. He's like, I don't really see how. And as we're talking about that, he expressed to me, he goes, listen, I just, you know, he goes, I, I just really... Um, he didn't say he hates religion, but he said, he's like, he said basically that he's like, I hate religion. I don't mm. mean, he didn't say the word hate. I don't remember exactly one, but basically it fails my test. Religion fails my test because look at all the horrible things. It's just, it's immoral. Mm. Look at how horrible this is. And I was like, okay, right. let's examine that a little bit. And I said, so immoral, like, how do you know? Let's talk about morality. And almost in, almost in the same breath, like, I don't know that I even witnessed him inhale between Religion is awful, and mm-hmm. nobody should pursue it because it's immoral. Then he said, out of his mouth, well, I don't believe there's any objective morality. Right. I'm like, well, okay, let's explain this. I said, then what What do you think morality is? Like, tell, tell me your thing. And he explained his theory, and his theory was that morality is aesthetic. And it's basically the preferences yeah. that people have evolved to have because this, because the where we are now, obviously, is the way that history has unfolded. And because humanity developed in a certain way physically chemically (laughs) like neurologically socially 
we've gotten to a place where we have this thing called morality and really what it is, like his, his description was it's an aesthetic preference. And I'm like, then what makes anyone's mm-hmm. better than anyone else's? And right. he, he didn't have an answer. He's like, well, then we have these preferences and blah, blah, blah. And so what if we had developed differently? I mean, what if we mm. developed such that our aesthetic preferences was that, were that killing innocent people from time to time, like that would like mm-hmm. every now and then you got to torture and kill an innocent person. Right. And he's like, well, I mean, if we had developed that way, then that's what would be moral, but we didn't. We developed in this mm-hmm. way. And I'm... I well, would, some people have. Right. Some people have developed that way to right. think that killing innocent people is okay. Exactly. That's an aesthetic preference so to them. I'm yeah. beside myself going, wait a minute. You just said religion is bad because it fails your moral test. Mm-hmm. Then you said there's no such thing as objective moral truth. Right. There's no... Like, whatever you say about morality, you're not saying true sentences about the world. You're expressing an aesthetic preference. Mm-hmm. And the next sentence said, if humanity had developed differently such that things that are clearly immoral were, if those were our aesthetic preferences instead, that those would be the moral things. Mm-hmm. How is it that you get to religion is awful because it fails my moral test? Mm-hmm. And when I asked him about like, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. I, I only sort of got what he was saying. Cause it wasn't really well developed. Um, I was like, I get what you're saying, but what about why? Why should I care about that at all? Why should I care about your aesthetic preferences if it's better for me to enslave people, hurt people, take mm-hmm. their things, exploit them, lie about them to get ahead, whatever, whatever moral, obviously immoral right. things you can think of? Like, why do I care about your aesthetic preferences at all? And he's just kind of like, well, yeah, I mean, there's no objective fact of the matter. And then he kind of excused himself, like, maybe, but maybe I've just read too much Nietzsche, and then took off. I'm like, <laughs> oh. I, yeah, and and it was a little bit. It was disheartening because uh, I might be wrong about this, but I don't think I am. Mm. I think he sort of thought of himself as intellectual, or thought he thought of himself as one of the smart guys. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. and he's like, "Well, I'm smart, and I've read Nietzsche, and so I just don't. I sort of don't live in the land of objective morality with superstitious religious people." There, you know, he wasn't stuck up, he wasn't snooty, but it's kind of clear that he thought. Other people, religious people in particular, were sort of morally and intellectually beneath him, and it's a it's a heartbreaking thing to see mm-hmm. because what actually is happening <clears throat> is um, I don't even know how to explain it. It's like foolishness and intelligence at the same time, right? And it's like you know enough stuff to justify like the most unwise worldview. I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, but I know enough, and I've read Nietzsche and, and some other stuff. So I've thought about this stuff, but it turns out it supports my really, uh, like, false and childish worldview. And that's – it's heartbreaking because, like, where, cause mm-hmm. where do you start with that? And you go, wait a minute. These things are all logically incompatible. It's like, yeah. yeah, yeah. We actually didn't get to have that conversation, but – Not yet, like, yeah. How do, you, how do you believe that? How do you believe that religion fails the moral test, but there are no moral facts? And – Morality, it literally is defined by the aesthetic preferences of humanity, which, by the way, there is no, like, single, unified, univocal set of yeah. of moral aesthetic preferences, if that's what you want to reduce them to. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that was, I say frustrating. I don't mean frustrating like I wanted to shake them, but it's, like, frustrating. Like, man, you you are clearly smart enough to right. see that this, that this can't be true. Mm-hmm. But there was this um, sort of general... I guess lack of lack of curiosity mm-hmm. about about the coherence of a of a worldview, such that it wasn't a weird question for him to ask. So what if the Bible's true? Like if the Bible's true, what difference what difference does that make to me at all? Right. I'm like, if the Bible's true, then God is the then Jesus is the God of the universe, and He created you to be in relationship with Him. And if mm-hmm. you choose not to, then you miss out on all of His on all of His attributes, like light and love and, <laughs> and all of those things that you yeah. hold so that you hold so dear that you know that it's better to care for a baby than it is to kill one and right. and how do you like the things that you care about and you know that are important and valuable and all that those those are only true because the bible is true you get you get what i mean right like you of know course was, like, absolutely yeah. all that is only true and so if you say well, if the bible's true like what does that matter to me like i couldn't I don't even know how to put it into words, the sort of lack, yeah. of, lack of curiosity. Right. Well, I mean, it's because if you spend five minutes reading the Bible, right, even in the first couple chapters of Genesis, yeah. you'll find out very quickly why it matters if the Bible is true, right? Yeah. Um, I've, been, I've, re- I've, read, I've been reading other religious texts 
very recently because mm-hmm. I've had the opportunity to um, fellowship with and evangelize to Muslims and Mormons quite a bit. So I've read the Book of Mormon and some other LDS literature, and I've read. Uh, I'm reading through the Quran right now, about halfway. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not. It doesn't take very long when you actually read other people's points of view to find out. Like, okay, if this is true, these are the implications from it. Right. It's not. I, I definitely would never, ever, especially now ever say about the Quran, well, who cares if the Quran is true? Like, what difference does it make? Mm -hmm. Now, it's very obvious when you read the Quran, what difference it makes if it's true. And with the Bible, what difference does it make if it's true? It's just infinitely just important and different and all of that. And so, I think it's just, it demonstrates a couple things. One of the most tragic being the the self-contradictory just nature of that. There, I can think of at least two other conversations I had where that same thing was displayed of them like have a square block and a triangle hole and wants to try to shove the square block. It's not, um, I want to clarify for anybody who might be thinking this, it's not, it's not like we're saying they have a different opinion than us and we disagree with them and they're wrong. No, mm. what they're espousing is literally logically incoherent. Mm. It doesn't, you cannot reconcile it. Yeah. You can't on the one hand say, well, religion is, pa- fails my moral test. And then on, then say, well, I mean, all morals are just aesthetically displeasing. Mm. Those things don't work in reality. Yeah, you could say. Yeah. I don't like religion because it fails my moral test. But like he didn't mm-hmm. say it fails my moral test. We mm-hmm. should have. He just said it's immoral. Look yep, at all sure. the moral, look it's at all the moral outrages yeah. and atrocities that happen on, on account of religion or something like that. And and but then his foundation for morality was the accident of human aesthetic preferences. Right. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I got a couple more anecdotes we could share and stuff. But what about you? Any uh, anything in any highlights yeah. in particular you want to throw on the table? I was going to say, like, I don't have any conversations that um, really developed too far to mm-hmm. like really dig into them. Um, I had some where um, uh, there's so we had um, Laga has interns that come from different countries. Um, so our team wasn't just Norwegians and then mm-hmm. us. Our team was Norwegians, us, and a few different countries mm-hmm. beyond that. Um, and um, one of the um, interns was going and asking people just straight out um, because being from a different mm-hmm. culture, you know, we have that little um, uh, uh, leeway, I guess. Yeah. We Norwegians. have that license yeah. to step all over <laughs> yeah. cultural boundaries. So, and yeah. um, She was um, just walking up to people and asking them, like, hey, would you call yourself a good person? Do you think you're a good person? Nice. So that led to some interesting conversations. Um, but nothing where, and then this is, kind of what I've been stewing on as you've been talking. Um, nothing where the conversation took the turn that we like look for, for mm-hmm. it to be like a real evangelistic um, conversation. Um, so there were things like that. Um, talks about science and faith, if they um, can be compatible or if they are totally opposites. Um, there was a talk that wasn't at Skeptics Week. It was like actually at a concert that Jake and I went to. That's right. Um, where we met someone who um, talked about how they prayed, um, mm-hmm. but never heard back from God. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of just basically my conversations at Skeptics Week were um, along the lines that you were describing, Cam. Like I think you did a good um, summary of what the general... Um, uh, mindset that we encountered was, um, but I was curious. Um, so if we had conversations where they took the turn, Mm -hmm. which I don't think, so the turn, like in the first place, especially talking about like the fear of evangelism, Mm -hmm. like how scary that is. Um, I think the really scary part is we want to get to the point where the conversation turns and we actually have their ears and their heart Mm -hmm. open and we're having a conversation about um, the things of God Mm -hmm. where they're actually being receptive um, to them. So the scary part is all up to that point. And then once I think any Christian reaches that point where someone turns in their heart to actually hear us, then I think every Christian would be on fire Mm -hmm. and be like, Oh, I got to get this news out. Like, let's Mm -hmm. go, let's talk about it. And now that you're receptive, like let's communicate. Um, But up to that point, like, that's where we have the fear. Um, and I think that point is like, um, between God and 
that person themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's their own decision. So kind of like your conversations where it's this really exciting thing and you guys are like, yeah, we, we, they raised this question Mm -hmm. that was totally, you know, it's a big question. Let's attack that. And then it got to, we got some tension and we got some fun argument going on and then they just walked away. Um, so, um, there's a missionary that I read about. I think his name was Vincent Donovan Mm. who, um, went to East Africa to the Maasai people. Hmm. Um, and he talked about how um, in his attempts to share the gospel with the Maasai people, um, he had many conversations, but he always wanted to start with the um, foundation of sin and pointing out that we have sinned and that we should have guilt and um just, yeah, just helping an awareness or a consciousness of one person's guilt. Um, so he kept having conversations and was trying to use that as the starting point um, and realized that just they weren't grasping. Every person he talked to um, wasn't grasping um, the concept of sin mm-hmm. or even that they should feel guilty or anything like that. Um, and he kept having that experience until he had a breakthrough with one gentleman who um, asked him a question about forgiveness. Um, And it was specific. I don't remember the particulars, but um, basically the man asked him about forgiveness and the way that man asked the question helped Donovan to um, realize what the man's mindset was. Mm. Um, And he realized like, oh, the way they... So in the book, he gets into like um, how they conceptualize um, sin and guilt, mm-hmm. and it's just totally different from how he or how we would yeah. conceptualize guilt. And for them, it's a lot more um, tied to um, relationships. I don't remember, like I said, the particulars, yeah. but they have a different concept of how guilt and sin and forgiveness and all mm-hmm. those different ideas work. Mm-hmm. Um, and when mm-hmm. someone is owed... Um, uh, when someone should be guilty or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so that experience helped him to rephrase and then to also factor into his gospel conversations um, symbols and analogies and concepts that were familiar to the Maasai people, mm-hmm. um, to their culture that already existed, um, helped him to realize how he can present the gospel and present the concept of sin in a way that made sense to their ears. Um, So, um, assume, or let's say you guys had those conversations and the turn did happen Mm -hmm. where they didn't leave, thank you for the coffee and take off. Yeah. But instead those um, conversations you had turned into conversations where their hearts and their ears were open and you were able to have a genuine conversation. Um, I'm basically I'm asking mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. how would you yeah. not just present the concept that they asked about to them and the gospel to them, but how would you specifically being in Norway among people who have this mindset that you described, Kim? Um, how would that influence and change how you present the concepts of the gospel? Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> the question, right? Mm-hmm. It's a big so question. That's, yeah. yeah, we're still discovering that, right? So we're brand new babies at at that. How, mm-hmm. do, how do we? Because um, <clears throat> that's a valuable insight. A valuable, ins- a valuable. It is a valuable insight <laughs> to say that I have. I work inside of a certain conceptual framework, and my things are connected and associated and attached with all of these presuppositions and assumptions that ha- that are unspoken, unwritten. They're just they're just part of the air the air that I breathe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we talked about that when uh, Whitney and I were in our training, and they said, we, you know, if you ask a Hindu, would you like to be born again? Mm. I'm like, yes, I've been born again many. I've been born many times, and yes, right. I would like to be born again. Well, there's because that's because when an American Christian says, "Do you want to be born again?" There's a bunch of baggage that we don't often mm. consider. So that thing about how do we keep faithfully keep the gospel message in a way that is contextual for the people who are here. And potent inside their worldview. I don't have a good answer to that yet. Mm-hmm. I'm thankful that we share a lot of assumptions about our worldview. 
were first world Western nations mm. built on Christian ethics, which gives us a lot of common ground. Even if it's not obvious that mm-hmm. the ground is common, it is. And it gives us, um, it gets us a long way there with one another. Mm-hmm. But then, but then who knows? I, I don't know. There's yet. a lot. I mean, there's, so there's a couple insights I think I might be able to share. I mean, we have been missionaries here for uh, uh, over a year. Um, so, um, one of the pieces of advice we got from people, um, uh, from Joy and Jim actually, was like, uh, when talking to Norwegians about like sin specifically, because that's such a huge part about the gospel. I mean, it's only the thing we're being saved from, right? Um, one of the things we're being saved from. Uh, and so, how do you communicate that to a different culture? That one of the things that they understand Norwegians, like not understand, but resonates with them, mm-hmm. uh, is the is the word brokenness. So I've used that a couple times mm. with with Norwegians evangelizing with them. I'm like, listen, you. It doesn't take me very long to find out that I, as a human being, am broken. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you can point to a lot of times in your life where you've realized, like, you're broken. Like, you you do, and, and the throwaway question is, have you ever done something that you knew was wrong? Like, yeah, of course. Okay, did you know it was wrong while you were doing it? Yeah, of course. I'm like, okay, so that's the thing. <laughs> I think that's the thing we need to talk about. Like, we constantly do things we know are wrong. Why? It's not because we're good people who do bad things. It's because we're bad people who do bad things. Um, we're broken people who do bad things. And so I've talked to that a couple times with uh, Norwegians, and that's kind of resonated with them a little mm-hmm. bit to, to the point where they that prompts another question or they want to keep going with the conversation and be like, okay, so what's the solution? I've had, I had one person in, Nor- in Bergen ask me, why do I need someone else to come in and fix my own brokenness? Mm-hmm. Very Norwe- After living here for over a year, very right. Norwegian question. Why would I bother someone else with it? Right. Why mm-hmm. does someone else have to come help me do this? Because Norwegians are very self-sufficient. That's just part of their culture. That's baked into their culture. Um, and so why do I need someone else to come fix my own brokenness? And the shortest answer was, it's because you're broken. Mm-hmm. It's because you can't, because you are broken, you can't fix yourself. Someone has to come do it for you. Mm-hmm. And that's, and then I got to share the gospel with her. So, it really, the short answer, Bailey, is it really just depends on who I'm talking to. Mm. Uh, I, I've talked to Norwegians who are very spiritual, who are already open to concepts like sin and ha- wanting to have right relationship with their creator. And in that case, it's kind of easier to go more Christianese, if you know what I mean? Mm. Like to kind of go to the more traditional route like I would in America and talk about sin, redemption, uh, substitutionary atonement, stuff like that, um, and explain those. I want to just say that to their face and <laughs> assume they knew what I meant. Um, and then other times I'll be talking to people who are uh, like uh, Indra on uh, Skeptics Week, who I love, and he's an awesome dude, um, who's just a complete atheist. It's just like, I have a lot of criticisms about the Bible. What did God even give up when he sacrificed himself on the cross? Yeah. That was literally the he question he asked us. stay dead. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was the question he asked us. He's like, what did God give up on the cross? And I'm like, are you just handing this to me on a platter? You just want me to explain <laughs> to you the gospel? And so... Um, I'll approach that conversation differently and I'll approach, you know, the person who talked to us at that red, you know, concerts, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, about uh, some of the things they were talking about. I'll approach that differently and it really depends on the person, but focusing on. um, So, because I like the brokenness, I think, is uh, rings true for me as a really practical, um, uh, appropriate way to frame um, sin, Mm -hmm. at least to introduce sin. for a Norwegian. Um, so like practically, cause I know like ultimately this question has been burdening us since before we got on a plane and moved right. here. Um, but for your situations, like literally that you just talked about, mm-hmm. um, what kind of practicals beyond that would you use? Cause the brokenness mm-hmm. one, I think that's awesome. Brokenness and is I one. Wish yeah. I would have used the word brokenness. Yeah. A lot more. Cause <laughs> Re- even yeah. just to supplement that a little bit, um, I've had, uh, gosh, definitely more than five conversations in Norway where um, people have just unloaded um, all the baggage of their life to me mm-hmm. without me prompting it at all. Like yeah. um, mm-hmm. maybe a tiny bit, like maybe I showed that I was a nice guy or whatever, but I've had a lot of conversations compared to the U.S., like mm-hmm. living in the U.S. all my life, maybe once or twice. Yeah. And not even in my own household did conversations like that happen where 
I'm just sitting there and they just unload all the weight of their life on me. Mm-hmm. Like we're a lot more barred up. Um, but in Norway, I've had a lot of those conversations where it seems like I've done nothing and they just entrust me with tons of personal yeah. baggage of their life. Um, which it's not a weight or anything at all to receive. It's like, it's crazy a gift. For, yeah. It's mm-hmm. a that's gift. A, yeah. Cause and they don't, in general, they don't talk with each other that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the, we have this advantage, like you and Jacob talked about earlier that we can just sort of just trample their social expectations. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's another one is if you're a safe person that they can, like they can talk to because among each other, it's a lot less common. So Norwegians mm. tend not to complain. Um, they understand because they've been uh, um, exposed to America for a while that we say, hey, how's it going? And that just means hello. Mm. But here, like, when you ask someone, how are you doing? Like, that's a question that you've asked them and they answer you. I had a friend mm-hmm. <clears throat> a couple weeks ago. I was like, how are you doing? Are you well? He's like, well, I'm struggling with something at work right now. I don't know which direction I'm supposed to take. And and I was, of course, glad to hear mm. that. But that's not what I was asking. Mm-hmm. I was just, I just wanted to, he's, I was saying hello. Saying and I, I was saying hello and I love you. So... That thing where it's like, okay, I've got somebody that I can actually be honest with mm-hmm. um, because we're not going to – because we're going to be self-sufficient and uh, I'm not going to brag and I'm not going to complain. I'm just kind of going to kind of stay in the middle mm-hmm. is something of a high value here. I mean, most uh, – the Norwegians I've talked to about, have you guys heard about the happiness literature, right? So there are researchers that study glo- happiness globally and who are the happiest people in the mm, world. And yeah. the Scandinavians mm-hmm. are always really high. And every Scandinavian I've talked to goes, no, I mean, that's no. I mean, you just, when people ask you, they give mm-hmm. you a survey and it basically is giving you the opportunity to complain. As a Norwegian, I just am not going to complain about that stuff. Right? Yeah. So it's going to so it's <laughs> going to make it make me look like things that aren't bad are right. the things that are bad aren't bad. Anyways, so all of, all of that to say, I think um, I think that's a that's a gift when they're when people are willing to share people in any context, of course, but especially here to say, well, you know what? Here's really what I'm struggling with, or here's really what's weighing heavy on my heart or in my life, or that I'm anxious about or confused mm-hmm. about. Um, that's a huge gift because in my mind, one of the main barriers we have to the gospel landing, right? So, and the gospel can land and be rejected, but I mean, for it to like, for it to land and not be a fairy tale, but be like this real thing mm. that I, Ulla Nordman, that I have to, which is the Norwegian John Doe, right? But like a Norwegian person has to go, oh my gosh, okay, I have to decide if this is true or false. For it to land, I think that there are several barriers, and one of the big ones is. Um, sort of that is is uh, convincing somebody, or for somebody, I would say it differently, not convincing them, but for somebody to see their own need. Mm-hmm. And here, I in fact, I've heard I've heard that lots of times. Asking regions, why don't you believe in God? And because I don't need to. My mm-hmm. my legs aren't broken. I don't put a cast on them. Right. We've ta- mm-hmm. we've had that conversation a lot. Mm-hmm. So to be like, well, there's, there's a need. What? God, uh, you have have a need to have a relationship with your Savior. You have a need of salvation. Like mm-hmm. there's and and for people who think they have no needs, um, then they're not going to see their need of a Savior. I don't feel right. I don't feel guilty. All my stuff is taken care of. I don't feel alienated from the God mm-hmm. who made me. This sort of the su- supernatural thing. Like for me, I think that's part of the um, opportunity that I have is like to at least consider. In a certain sense, I don't like the natural, supernatural distinction. Right. That's right. So mm. you guys can save your emails. But <laughs> but to consider that there's a realm there's a realm beyond this one, right? That existence isn't limited to what you can see under a microscope. And to even allow that as a possi- like a possibility inside your view of what is real and what exists. I think I have the opportunity maybe to share some of that stuff. Like, okay, we've got the science, science that tells us about this. Mm. And then uh, what about these other things? And actually, and what does science have to say about them? Like, what does science tell us that gives us some insight about this other stuff? Um, I think we can help to dissolve that barrier a little bit. Mm. But then there's one where it's like there's a need of a savior. Mm. People who know that they, people who know they need a savior, are a lot, they're a lot better able to understand the gospel. Again, they can still reject it. Right. They can say, okay, this is something I have to contend with, but no, it's not for me. But being able to get that, the tr- the the insofar as it's a proposition, like the proposition of the gospel to stick in mm-hmm. such a way that someone has to contend with it, um, I think are 
trouble is people seeing the need. And so if you're having people tell you, okay, here, like, yeah. let me, just, let me level mm-hmm. with you. Uh, here are the things that are, uh, that are not great. Right. And you have a way to say, well, listen, we have a, you have a need of a savior. Like you, humanity has that need. Like Jacob said, we can talk about brokenness. Um, a, a lot of the Norwegian people that I've met are like activistic. They're like, listen, humans are destroying the planet. Right. They're mm-hmm. really mean and awful to each other. <clears throat> they're hateful. Injustice. They're bigoted. Yeah. They're unjust. Right. And I go, yeah, that is true. <laughs> Where does that come from? Mm-hmm. And there's, there's maybe the, um, the assumption that, well, it's, it comes from ignorance. We just need to educate people better. We just need to educate people better and have better political systems. Yeah. And then, I mean, that is, that's a three second conversation to destroy that myth. What we need is better education, better political systems. Like we have the, right now we're at the pinnacle of human political expression and we have, you have access to all of human knowledge in your pocket on your phone right, right now. Is it helping or is it making things worse? Like the problem can't just be that people need to be educated the right way. And yeah, so sorry. I could, I, yeah, no, you're right. I could, mm. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go. I'm like, I'm wound up, <laughs> but I'm not going to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I'll just leave that. There. Well, that's the thing. And so Bailey raises a really, really awesome question is how do we communicate the universal transcendent truths of the gospel? Um, to people specifically in our context who feel like they have no need for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's by uh, when they, First of all, they say they have no need for the gospel, and then they're still unloading, right? They right. know that there's baggage. They know that there's brokenness. They know that there's injustice. Christ came to save us from all those things. Right. Uh, talking to them about the brokenness in the world and how Christ came to fix that, and Christ didn't just come to fix the brokenness in the world. What do you, He loves us so much. What he wants to fix first is the brokenness in the human heart. Right. Well, because that's he, the only way to fix the brokenness in the world. That's true. You have, it's like, yeah. It starts in, with, it's in, it's by transforming human hearts. Yeah. And so we get into that. And I mean, we don't, we don't ever change anything. We don't pull punches with, listen, you are going to stand before God one day and God wants to live in right relationship with you. That was another thing I was going to say. Well, we have, don't have time for it anymore. But another thing I was going to say was relationship seems to resonate with them as well. Mm-hmm. That God came to want an actual relationship with you. And you can decide whether or not you want to enter that relationship of someone who has done nothing but good to you and wants to fix your brokenness and knows your brokenness and knows the brokenness in you that you don't even know about and wants to save you and heal you and change you and live in relationship with you for eternity anyways. Or you can decide to not have that relationship, to not have your brokenness fixed, and you can decide to live outside of that relationship forever. And that's your decision. And Christ offers to fix injustice in you, brokenness in you, to forgive you of sin, to have a great relationship with you for eternity, and that you can have with us as well, but who cares about us? It's all about Jesus. Um, or you cannot, and that's the gospel. And I think that preaching that in a Norwegian context so far has uh, uh, worked in the sense of making it clear to them. I'm not trying to say we have it figured out because we have a ton more to learn and we're learning every day. But I mean, that is, uh, that's been something we've used, that all of us has used, that people seem to understand. And that's the gospel. That's the gospel in America and in Africa to the, what, what's their name? I'm going to say Messiah. it. Messiah people. Yeah. Um, and that's the gospel to Scandinavia as well. Mm-hmm. So thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you guys so much for your stories and your reflections and your really great questions. Come and on. yeah, <laughs> this is lots of fun. And uh, the fun just keeps going because we actually have a follow-up group uh, for Skeptics Week that we're uh, leading actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're the leading and we have people signed up for to go through the gospel of Luke together. That's going to be really awesome. Uh, I'm really excited to hear what conversations come from that, what insights they have to share, and opportunities to build relationships with these people and hopefully introduce them to Jesus. So please pray for us and tune in in two weeks. God bless. Thank you for watching this episode of Word First Radio. If you like the podcast, please like, share, and subscribe. If you want to learn more about Word First and how you can support the ministry spiritually and financially, check out the links in the description below. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Word First Radio, and we'll see you again next week. God bless.